Hello, Tanse Anin. Good afternoon. Welcome to APTN In Focus. I'm Daryl Stranger. Today we're going to be taking a look at the spring equinox and what it means to Indigenous people and some of the traditions and events that mark the occasion. Now, as always, we want you to join in on our conversation. You can tweet us at APTN In Focus or you can send us an email to infocus at aptn.ca. Now, before I introduce you to our guests today, here's a quick story about one of those celebrations. Niska Communities celebrated Hobie in Northern BC this past weekend. It's an annual event welcoming the new harvest season. Dance groups came from all over the North to share their songs and culture. APTN's Lee Wilson was there came together to celebrate Hobie in the village of Lakalzap. All dance and cultural groups dressed in a regalia, drum their way into the community center and a grand entry. Samugit La, a Niska house chief, is excited for Hobie to showcase their culture. I am very, very happy that this has happened to us. We've been able to bring back part of our uh, culture you know, and, and we're still doing so. We're going to continue uh, bringing back as much as we can. He says that in the olden days, large groups would travel to the Nass Valley to harvest oolikins, a small fatty fish important to many nations on BC's coast. Years ago, we used to have friends here to come visit us every, every year. About this time, about five to 10,000 people would come here just for the oolikin. OBA is now an annual event celebrating the new harvesting season. Skahatsagon shared that the cultural event as we see it now originated in his Niska community, Get One Silk. Hobie actually originated in the, the village of Get One Silk back in the 90s as an actual event to celebrate uh, the upcoming moon, the harvest, the harvesting season, and as a way to express ourselves culturally. He added that this time of year, it is a Niska belief to look up at the crescent moon and watch if it's facing up or down. It can signal a good harvesting season and they could share their preserves and celebrate. It's like this, when it's shaped like a hobby, a spoon, um, it correlates that we're gonna have a great year. So we're gonna have great fishing, great olican season, berries, hunting, all these little harvesting things that we do throughout the year. Lackles App culture dancers performed a peace song for a group from Scotland in attendance. The National Museum of Scotland will repatriate a totem back to Niska lands later this year. Niska honored their longtime cultural directors, as well as cheering on their children and youth who fearlessly perform in front of the large crowds. And so learning that knowledge is not only a big, big undertaking, but it's really fulfilling as well because you get to see all the kids give it their all from the oldest elder to the youngest kid just out there giving it their all showing who they really are. Kingol cultural dancers shook the building with a powerful performance. Their director Sam Nelson Peel says that is how their late elder Rufus Watts encouraged them to perform. We tend to sing from our stomach and that's where all the power comes from and, and in turn he also said the to dance and sing loud enough so that they hear you on the other side and that you shake the earth as you do it. Skahatsuk on shared 10 years ago, their nation did a survey and found there were only three or 4% of fluent Niska speakers left. The language programs and cultural groups are a big part of passing down Niska culture. More youth integrated into the, the language with not just at school or at cultural events, but at home now. And it's used more often and it's become the new normal for our youth to be able to understand our language when we're speaking to them, when we're singing, what we're singing, and all that stuff. It's been hugely beneficial for our youth. And Lee Wilson joins us now to talk about the event. Lee, thanks so much for being here. Uh, thank you for having me, Daryl. So I know, Lee, you've covered this ceremony in, in previous years, uh, but I just wanted to go back maybe to the first time you covered it. And can you tell me about that and, uh, and how that went? Yeah, definitely. The first time I got to cover Niska Hobie was in the village of uh, Getlik Damix. So that was in 2022. So it was the celebration of the Niska New Year. 
So they're celebrating the new harvesting season. And one of the things that really stood out to me was the grand entry of that event. Uh, that was my first time seeing Hobie in person. And watching all the groups come out together in a grand entry was something powerful because the groups all come out together and you get to really see the regalia, you get to hear the drumming and the powerful songs that are happening. And by the end of that grand entry, the, all the groups um, from the, the four Niska communities are all together singing as one. So it was a really powerful experience to get to see that in person. Well, Lee, you mentioned some of what, what happens at the, at the ceremony. Can you describe some of the ceremonies and, and what else goes on? Yeah, definitely. So the ceremonies are, uh, so this one, it was a little bit unique at this last Hobie. Uh, one of the things that happened was there was a totem pole raising that happened right before Hobie started. And it was the Samogit or Chief La. He was raising um, a replica pole of a pole that now stands in UBC. It was um, from the early 1900s. And so I got to see that totem pole ra raising uh, along with the community. But some of the ceremonies that take place are, um, there was another group from Scotland, uh, a delegation from the uh, from Scotland, because the National Museum of Scotland is repatriating a totem pole back to the Niska, and that pole um, has been there for I think over a hundred years. But um, the group got the the one of the groups. It was the Lakazap Cultural Dancers. They performed a peace song for that group. So the delegation from Scotland stood in the middle and they performed this really beautiful peace song for that group. And one of the really cool things for Hobie that I get to see uh, one of the ceremonies is the passing from the host community to the next community. So the groups come together at the end of this, um, the end of Hobie, and they get to dance together uh, and sing songs. And there's a moon that hangs above the whole event. And then that moon gets passed from the host community this year, to the host community next year. So they passed it from Lackel Zap to the community of G Gingolith, which will be the host next year. Yeah, it looks like a beautiful ceremony and uh, it looks like something that, you know, um, looks like it's going to be great going forward and, and hopefully you can cover more. Um, uh, Lee, how did COVID affect what was being done with the ceremony? Did, was it canceled during the COVID years? Ago? What, how did COVID affect everything that was going on? Definitely, Daryl. So COVID did have an effect on Niska Hobie. So in Vancouver, there was two years. They have, they have a Hobie event in Vancouver as well. And for two years, that event didn't run. And then last year in the Niska communities, um, there were concerns of COVID uh, affecting many Northern communities. So last year um, in the village of Gitwin Silk, there was a more subdued, um, limited community only Hobie last year. And I think there was a celebration, but it was a little bit more, it wasn't the same as this year. So the celebration that took place this year was the Hobie similar to what I remember in 2020 with the, all the groups coming together celebrating and then uh, with the hall packed with uh, guests from all over the north, because there's other groups that come and perform as well uh, at Hobie that are from different areas around Northern BC. Well, Lee, just sort of on that note, maybe how, how important is the event to the Niska communities and how important is it that we, they, or they could have it in person again? I think it's a, Hobie is a really important event for the Niska because one of the things that happen is this transfer of knowledge that happens when they're uh, pa they're practicing and performing the songs. Because basically, um, I remember being told in, uh, when I did this, the story that um, the Niska, the fluent speakers, uh, a survey showed that 10 years ago, they were down to 3% of fluent speakers left. So the event of being able to practice um, the songs, the ceremonies, the dances uh, with the knowledge keepers down to the uh, the people that are the cultural directors and down to the young people, uh, they get to celebrate and uh, yeah, celebrate their culture and then basically have pride in sort of passing down th this knowledge and be able to learn together and perform uh, uh, together as a community. So it's, it's definitely a really important um, event for the Niska. And Lee, I know in uh, in your story you mentioned that the or you had just mentioned previously how the moon is passed from one host community to the other, right? Is that, is that am I getting that right? So, what's it like to cover this as an annual event? What sort of things sort of maybe change or stay the same year over year? Yeah, it's really interesting to cover it as an annual event because the the event switches from different communities, and uh, so it's not always held in the same one. It, it transfers between the four. I haven't got to cover the one in Vancouver just because it's a far distance away from me, uh, but there is something that does happen uh, that there's different um, yeah, the yeah, the different groups do sort of celebrate in different ways that they 
but there is just definitely a lot of pride in the community to be able to share uh, the, their their preserves and share their culture with other people. So um, the things that I got to see is that you get to speak with different people that are the the hosts from that nation. So it's a it's you're just getting to talk to different people from their community, and they have different things that they value um, culturally. And like I mentioned, the, the Crescent Moon is, is a, a big piece of this event, right? So can you explain a little more um, for us what the moon signifies? I know you touched on uh, if it's going to be a good or bad harvest season, right? So can you touch a little more on, on what the, the Crescent Moon signifies? Yeah, definitely. So one of the, the Niska beliefs is that if the Crescent Moon is facing upward at the star, that they're going to have a good harvesting season. And that means they're going to have abundance of ulekin, salmon, berries, uh, and then by knowing that they're going to have a good harvesting season, that's when they know they can share their preserves with other people. So that's when they start Hobie and they invite other people in the community and start sharing it together and having this big celebration like we got to witness in the story you just showed. And the last one for you here, maybe a, a little outside of the uh, Hobie, but what are some of the other ways uh, maybe spring is, is celebrated in your area? Yeah, d definitely, Daryl. So I'm not exactly sure about different events that are taking place that are as big as Hobie right now or that just took place that just sort of put, took place. But I know that right now the, the communities around the, the Northwest are out harvesting ulikins right now. So uh, the Heisla are out down in the Kimano harvesting ulikins that they'll bring back uh, on the, the Skeena River. It's the Simchian that are harvesting ulikins to bring back their community. And then the Nas, uh, the Niska are harvesting right now. And then they will bring those back. So right now, like the sort of like the idea of celebration of Hobie, the new harvesting season. So right now, these uh, northern communities are har actually harvesting the food, or the, or the ulekin, the small fatty fish, to share back, share back with their communities. Well, he certainly seems like a lot going on uh, in your neck of the woods over there. And w I mean, we certainly appreciate you coming on and updating us with what Hobie is and what some of the, the spring means to the, the communities and the people out there. So we appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on, Lee. Definitely. Thanks for having me, Daryl. Take care. Well, from Western Canada to Eastern Canada now, the city of Burlington, Ontario commissioned nine Indigenous artists for artwork unveiled as part of an Indigenous art walk and ceremonial fire for a spring celebration there. Check it out. We ask and intend to create a sacred space for the purpose of this solstice and for this yeah. art walk and the fact that we are all here together as one. I ask for the healing of this group of people that is here right now. I ask it to leave through my physical, my mental, my emotional, my spiritual and my cellular memories now. I ask the tobacco that we give today to you all that you put a little prayer and that you let go of any negativity, that you let go of the anger, the sadness, any regrets that you have. Yeah. Well, today it was, uh, is the equinox or solstice, whichever you want, you want to call it, right? So we had, as a team, decided that we were going to also um, do it on the solstice. And for myself, as being the, the healer and stuff like that, I. Um, I led the walk over from the pavilion way over there over to the museum and during that time we were in prayer. The solstice is, is the marking of a new, a new season, uh, a new beginning. Mother Earth is waking up. Um, it's a time of prayer. It's a time of renewal. Um, there's a lot of healing that happens in the spring, a lot of letting go, like from the winter. So we do a lot of letting go in the spring. Um, that's when, when you'll find the sap running from the trees, the maple trees, and the animals are waking up and, um, um, you know, like tree planting stuff is going on, right? Uh, for myself, it's just a renewal after the winter, so it's nice to have that breath right it's really nice to have that breath and that's 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 what solstice is for me there was a few of us that came together in the very beginning and talked about how it was important to showcase our teachings and who we are as a people and the city of burlington agreed
and that's why you see um, the electrical boxes all gather all, all covered up here in Spencer Smith Park which is a really cool thing because millions of people come through this area To me, the solstice, uh, this time of year is my favorite time of year. It's when everything just kind of starts waking up again. Um, it's about growth and renewal and rebirth. It's an opportunity to, um, you know, shake the, the dregs of the winter behind us and, you know, start anew and, you know, make new commitments and um, remind ourselves where we've come from and where we can go from here. There was nine Indigenous artists that were chosen um, and each of them represent uh, First Nations, Métis and Inuit uh, communities. Um, we wanted to really make sure that we were featuring a wide variety of artists and communities and voices um, so that we can really represent that um, First Nations communities, Indigenous communities are ever present um, and you know they deserve spaces to be uh, centered around their stories. I was very, very happy and very honored to, to be the artist that was chosen for this. Uh, um, one of the major things that was the attraction to the project was the uh, identifying that language would be an excellent theme to, uh, to develop uh, imagery on. And because I have a family who's involved in the, the revival of Indigenous language. My daughter is a speaker, my granddaughter is a student at what's called the Everlasting Tree School on the, the uh, territory that uh, works mainly in, uh, well, works only in the Mohawk language. So I, I have that in my household. Unfortunately, I'm not a, I'm not a speaker. My first language is, is stone. In bronze, so uh, I'm so happy that they've taken on the the revitalization of the of the language. This is, this is the seventh uh, public art piece that I've I've done uh, in collaboration with my daughter. Uh, she uh, provides me the language, I provide the imagery, and it's it's been a great great team. It's been a great great family effort. It, first of all, it's honoring women. Uh, it has to do with the resources and the land, and uh, you know that's that's something that the women uh, in their strength look after and, and, and maintain and, and ensure that that's uh, alive and well for the coming generations. It's also about the uh, the sharing of uh, information, our, our worldview. Uh, discussions that we have about what our aspirations are, the items that we have to deal with as Indigenous people, nationhood, peace and reconciliation, uh, looking, f you know, to uh, rid the the world of uh, events like the you know murdered and uh, missing women and girls. There's so much to make comment on. And again, the, the focus is not just on the relationship between uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. I'll be quite honest and say there, there are issues right within First Nations that, again, that's where reconciliation begins. And uh, we, have to, we have to learn to share w what our disputes are, uh, start on the path of, again, reconciliation, uh, share the truth share what our pains are, share, uh, share what our aspirations are. So that's all tied up in this piece of artwork, so. I'd say it's extremely important for Indigenous artists, Indigenous culture and traditions to be recognized in all places where people gather. Um, you know, it not only signifies and reminds people of the original um, owners and not owners but the original um, stewards of the land that we gather work and live upon but it also reminds people that there's a vibrant and diverse uh, history and cultures and traditions that we can all learn from it takes a lot of work it takes a lot of community consultation um, 
you know, indigenous peoples are not a monolith. You need to make sure you have a wide variety of perspectives and voices involved in the decision making, in the representation of all of the pieces that come together. Um, it was a long journey for us to get here. It started with a few um, engaged and uh, engaged community members and advocates that really brought this together. But it also means that the city has to be committed and that there's champions and advocates within uh, decision-making bodies that can help bring this work forward. Um, so it's not just you know a one, one-sided project. It really means that Indigenous and non-Indigenous community members need to come together to make this work happen. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's... it's uh... It's a breath of fresh air, right? It's a breath of fresh air and just being outside and being able to connect with the mother is, is like awesome. All right, we need to step aside for a moment here. When we come back, I'll be at the University of Manitoba to speak with Elder Norman Mead. Join our conversation now. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page. Follow or tweet us at APTN In Focus. And send your thoughts to infocus at aptn.ca. Welcome back to APTN In Focus. Our next guest, we're actually live on location interviewing him and we are interviewing Elder Norman Mead from the Indigenous Students Centre at the University of Manitoba. And Norman, it's, it's great to chat with you and you know, today the In Focus is all about 
um, spring and the spring equinox and, and what it means to us as Indigenous people. I wanted to ask you what the significance of spring and the spring equinox is um, for us as First Nations people and Indigenous people in general. Yeah, well, you know, spring equinox is, uh, as we know, it's a time when we think of getting out of that long, dark, cold winter and into a, a, a new season, right? It's, it's a season. It's not just a day. We talk about spring equinox as being a day like the 20th or the 21st, but it, it actually is the beginning of a new season. And for us as Indigenous people, it's the beginning of, of something new, a new season, new life, right? A time to, to plant. Yes. Well, and so it's it's a new season. So what comes with that new season? I imagine there's, um, you know, uh, herds of migration in terms of the animals and, and the food. I imagine that's got a big part to do with it. So what comes with the, the new season? Yeah, what comes with the new season? Well, you know, when we think of uh, the bird life, for example, right? Uh, we think of uh, those birds that go away for the winter to warmer climates and are coming back now. Uh, and it's nice to see the return of, uh, of those migratory birds that, that are, are coming back now for the long summer, yeah. you know, and uh, also the ones that hibernate, right? You know, not only the animals, but the insects too that hibernate. You know, they go also to rest for the winter, that long, cold winter. And now they're either coming out of their dens, hibernation places, or coming out of the ground, you know, the insects and that that come out. We also, it also reminds us of the water and how important that water is, right? We talk about flooding, but we talk about also the, the, the you know, the water that, in li that has that spirit of life in itself, right? And that's really important for us as Indigenous people when we think about the season of, uh, in this time of the year, the spring season or, or a time of, uh, uh, of equinox. Mm -hmm. And I wanted, I know the, the, the sun and the moon also play a big part in this, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, we know, I mean, the, the sun, when it crosses that, uh, the equator, uh, you know, uh, just uh, that, that day, you know, that minute of that day, you know, that's just a moment, right, when that sun crosses and from the southern to the northern hemisphere. But, I mean, we, we think about, about that as, as the time that it happens. But what comes after that is when that sun, you know, is, is uh, that our days get longer, our nights get shorter in the course of the warmth of the sun. You know, it, everything that has that, that has life needs that sun, you know, to warm the earth, right? Warm Mother Earth, so she can give life. And, you know, this is what uh, it's about, right? That sun, and of course the moon cycles also are part of that to let us know, you know, uh, the, that the grandmother moon is also there to, to let us know what's happening. We have 13 moons, um, you know, in, in a year, we say, right? And we think that each moon, like we call this the worm moon, you'll hear of that, the worm moon, yeah. So can you sort of explain that, uh, the, the worm moon for us? Yeah, the worm moon, it's not warm, it's worm, worm. Yeah, yeah like the worm moon is uh, when, you know, the insects are coming alive, wherever they have hibernated for the winter, out of the wood, out of the ground, you know. And we watch those that come out after hibernation. And we know that uh, spring has arrived, you know. Uh, the, our spring equinox is here to, to be with us until uh, until uh, the beginning of summer. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's really important uh, that we teach uh, our children and we teach each other about those times of the year, special times of the year. Right. Well, you mentioned teaching others and, and um, why that's so important. How can maybe somebody teach their either their children or, or their loved ones or a friend about how important this season really is so like what what can they do to maybe educate uh, someone else well you know the best thing to do is to go out on the land go out where the the real life is out on the land there with this beautiful sun we have even today it's nice warm it's, it's warm the wind is kind of blowing from the north it's a little cool but but it's nice out i mean that bright sun you know it brings us that warm warm heart warmth to the heart and it's good to go out with your children on on the land with this little bit of snow that we have on the ground mm -hmm. and a few weeks there where there won't be any snow but we'll have water and we should be out there teaching our children about uh, how to respect you know that water and that snow that's on the ground because it's there for our benefit it's there for us and it's there for mother earth you know and we should be teaching our children about about those things and not only the children, but one another. We should be out, you know, doing walks, you know, on on in uh, on the in, in, the, in the bush or wherever we might be, you know, even in the city here. I mean, it's nice to take your children out or go on on walks, you know, 
and there's a lot of a lot of people uh, you know out there that are doing those things but as indigenous people we like to pass that knowledge on and and show them that respect that we have for uh, one another but also for mother earth and for the sun you know uh, the beautiful wind that's blowing you know we should uh, we should be doing that well and it seems like spring can be a time where a lot of people uh, for whatever reason just maybe it's just the seasonal changes but the, the, some of their moods might get a little better come springtime uh, we're coming out of this winter mm -hmm. um but is does that sort of play a, a role in, in, in any of this and it just seems people are happier come this time of year is that yeah. something maybe that, you, that you've seen or is that just uh, more of a, a weather related thing no that is not just a weather related thing but it has something to do with the weather it has also something to do with uh, the warmth of the sun and and the moon at night you know it has uh, those moon cycles have a lot of uh, we don't know this a lot of us don't know that but it really has it plays on our emotions in many ways and the the the, the good emotion that we feel you know mm -hmm. from from those sources it's, it's that energy that we're feeling right and that's a beautiful energy that sometimes, and it's a natural energy, it's there all, always, every spring, right? And we celebrate that in different ways, you know? We celebrate that uh, energy that is there for us. And uh, it's nice to know that it's, it's always there every year. We go through the same, the same thing and uh, never fails us, right? Yeah, uh, natural law never fails us, you know? Yeah, and uh, it, it seems um, this is also a time for gathering. I, I, um, why is that so important that we all gather together and, and, and celebrate this, this new time, this new season? Yeah, well, you know, gathering is really important, right? Gathering together as, 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 as people and with uh, our pets and with our children too, you know, gathering together and just being, being there with them and with each other, right? I mean, there's lots of celebrations that go on this time of the year. Mm -hmm. Like I know in our Métis community, we celebrate, uh, you know, uh, in different ways. Our First Nations people celebrate. We just had a big celebration back home. I'm saying back home, meaning Hall of Water, Manigotagan area, where I'm from. We just had a big celebration there on the weekend, and uh, we call it our spring uh, festival. You know, uh, and uh, it, it's really it's really good to see people come out and enjoy. I mean, you can go fishing, you can go, uh, you can make fires. You know, uh, there's uh, you can do all of those things, and it's so good to get together with uh, with family and with community, right? Mm -hmm. And um, what's maybe your favorite part of of this season and, and the equinox and just this whole this whole time do you have a favorite part or is it all just sort of as one no i i i, I kind of uh, like the, the the a little bit later than this yet i mean i i like snow and and i but i i like to i like the planting season i like uh, you know going and planting trees i try to plant some trees every spring because this is a time then we when we relate to the trees uh, and spring equinox is a time that you know uh, some will will be taking their maple syrup right they'll be harvesting that maple syrup and others will be harvesting other medicines from the trees right the trees that that are that are older trees right and but i like to plant young trees so that my children or my grandchildren my great grandchildren will have a tree that they can say well grandpa planted this tree right and uh, it's nice when you can have that relationship with the, 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 the trees, but also with other plant life. Like I, I like doing gardens. I like planting seeds and watching, you know, the, the garden grow. And I do that with my, my grandchildren. They like it and I like it. And so we, we do that every year. You know, we have a garden up north in Manigotagan and we have, also have a garden in our backyard here in Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's just nice. So you mentioned you, you plant trees and stuff. What can, is that something people can do to, to sort of celebrate the season and, and like you said, be at one with the land and, and with the other creatures and that sort of thing? Like what's something maybe they can do or um, that to sort of celebrate the season? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, planting trees is something that helps our, our earth, yeah. the Mother Earth. It also helps our environment, right, to sustain its life in, in a good way. You know, that is important mm -hmm. that, you know, trees, uh, you plant a tree, you know, it takes a long time to, to, for it to grow. But it's good to plant it and then watch it grow and help it to grow, you know. That's a teaching in itself, like what do I do with this tree, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you have to water it and you got, it's got to be planted. Uh, some can be planted in the shade, others are planted in more sunlight, you know, all those kinds of things, right? Mm -hmm. It's important to the growth and the health of that, of that, of that plant or that tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, you know, to have your children or grandchildren, uh, you know, um, see that tree after it's, it's taking root 
you know I mean there's a, another time when you can relate to your children and let them know how that uh, tree has taken root in Mother Earth you know feeding off of the good soil that the Mother Earth has provided for for us and for that tree mm -hmm. and is there maybe anything else I know the we're talking about the tree planting but um and you had mentioned just going out on the land. Is that maybe just the basis of, of something somebody can do? Like, I'm, I'm just curious if somebody at home is like, oh, how can I you know, celebrate the season? Is it? Well, you know, the thing that we used to love doing uh, when I was a child, uh, when I was a young boy growing up, uh, we used to like going out a little bit later than this, uh, you know, when the ice starts uh, moving, uh, like breaking up in the river or the lake, you know, to go out there and, uh, and go and catch uh, fish when they, when they come up to the, to the rapids, you know. We used to love going down into the rapids there and jumping in the water and, and it's like a, a bear <laughs> going catching a fish you know and taking it home and uh, we used to really enjoy doing that and I my, my kids don't do it as much as we used to we used to do it every, almost every day like in, for a little bit of time in the spring mm -hmm. when the river would would open and the, the rapids would, would would be flowing right. yeah and you had to be careful because the rapids get kind of swift with all the water that you, that's coming over the rapids mm -hmm. and you got to be careful when you're doing it but you know you that's part of your culture and that's how we 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 you know we, we enjoyed doing it it didn't cost anything and we went and got our meal yeah well and why is it still so important that we celebrate this season in this in this time and maybe in this day and age why is it so important that we still celebrate these things well, you know, it's it just it's really it really has to do with the relationship to the land and, and to everything around us, right? The spirit is everywhere out there. The spirit of the land, the spirit of the water, the spirit of the animals, the spirit of, you know, the birds, the spirit of the fish. You know, there it's all there, right? And when you have that uh, that spirit that is so pure and fresh and 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 there, you know, that you can relate to it, you know, in a spiritual way. But you also can pray too. Like we also encourage, uh, you know, praying when you're out there in, 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 in the Creator's world. You know that you can you can go out and you can you can say your prayers out there if you if you if you wish to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And just give thanks, you know, to to creation. Yeah. Well, Norman, thank you so much for for joining us here today and and you know educating us a little bit on, on why the season's so important and, and what you know a, a few things of what people can maybe do to celebrate the season so um thank you so much miigwech for for your time and, and educating us a little bit here yeah well it's good to good to see you and it's nice to share my story a little bit with uh you know with with the spring equinox and uh it's time to enjoy life again and and just enjoy that 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 new and fresh life that's coming yeah well, we have to step aside uh, one more time here on APTN in Focus. We'll have more after the break.
Welcome back to APTN In Focus. Our next guest joining us is journalist Greg Horn. Greg produced a wonderful documentary on the importance of maple syrup to the Mohawk people. Here's a little bit of that documentary. Wahta is an important tree for us. We go back to, to our teachings and, and even look to the Ohonda Gariwa Dekwa. We acknowledge the, the maple tree Wahta for uh, being the leader of the tree life. When you get out on the land and be part of this process of uh, making syrup or maple sugar, then you, you get to understand why, why it's like that. In nature, when you look at uh, Wahta is the, is the leader, is, um, you know, it's the first tree when it's, it's a sign of spring and that the earth is renewing itself or, or continuing its duties uh, and, and that with springtime coming, that it's the first sign to show that, um, I guess, nature is continuing. I love the spring, you know, uh, most people hate it because it sort of turned muddy and everything. The, the spring means, you know, maple season. And uh, we head out to the, the sugar bush where all the uh, all the trees are and we, um, we have some lines up. We don't use the buckets anymore. So like I was saying, we, we've upgraded. When I first started, I had no idea what making maple syrup was. You know, I know it came out of the tree and I know I had to boil it down. I just didn't realize how much boiling was involved. And I think the first year my wife and I, we had about a bucket of sap and we boiled it down to maybe get a, a teaspoon of it. Greg, thank you so much for joining us here on APTN In Focus. Let's uh, first start off, uh, if you could tell us about spring uh, in your territory. Uh, spring here in uh, in Ganawage, uh, spring here in uh, in Ganawage, uh, is, is is a very interesting time. Um, not only is is everybody getting you know happier with the the longer days and and whatnot, but it also means uh, it's time to tap maple trees and and community members from um, from Ganawage uh, have been doing this for a number of years. I mean, it's something that that uh, people do across Quebec. Uh, so it's just one of those things that. Um, it's it, it's starting off now, and, and, and I think people are uh, really excited about it. So you brought up maple trees, and uh, I have to ask it, uh, one of the most delicious aspects uh, of it, I hear, is called uh, sugaring off. Am I, is that the right term? Can you describe that process for us? So, so, um, so part of that, that whole process, right, is, and uh, I'm, I'm no expert here on this, but uh, it's, uh, you know, Every every year, uh, you tap maple trees and uh, you, you you get sap and you boil it down to to maple syrup and then you make, uh, you can even boil it down even further uh, to to get candy and and one of the big things about uh, the, uh, the one of the big things about the experience of, of going to a sugar shack is to get um, maple candy where where they pour it right on right onto the snow and and that's 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 basically the whole sugar and off process. Well, I know maple and snow, I think I've had that at a local festival here and it's, it's just delicious. So a little jealous you guys get that a little more than, than we do. <laughs> but um, so just with, with everything going on, I mean, how important is the tradition to the Mohawk people and, and when did they sort of start this? Well, so this, uh, if, if you look back and you look into our, our traditions, um, maple is, is one of the important, one of the most important plants and trees in, in, in uh, our traditional uh, cycle of ceremonies. Uh, so every year, um, as part of our cycle of ceremonies, we give, uh, we have a festival for, for the maple tree. Um, and as a part of our Honda Cardi um, our opening, our opening prayer, um, where we give thanks to everything in creation. Um, there's a special uh, note made for uh, for the maple tree, um, and that's because of the 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 the, the, the sap and then uh, turning it into it, it, turning that into um, syrup. Because uh, after a long winter, being able to 
you know, uh, to, to, uh, it, it's one of the first signs of of, 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 uh, of renewal and that the new year has started and that, that you can now get um, tap these trees and, and get some, some more sustenance rather than just some, uh, you know, um, the, the, the food that you had stored over the winter, right? So this is something that's been, been part of uh, Haudenosaunee culture for, for, you know, millennia. And, and it's just something that, um, you know, we introduced uh, to uh, settlers here and, uh, you know, and they, they ran with it. And uh, now now they have, uh, you know, Quebec is, uh, is is the largest producer of maple syrup in the world. So, um, you know, but it, it was something that w was introduced to the world by the Haudenosaunee. Well, so then sort of on that same note, I mean, I have to ask, I, I don't know if you, you have an answer for this, but I mean, who looked at a tree and thought, oh, okay, we can, you know, make syrup from this? Um, well, the way the way our stories go is that um, you know it was um, you know long winter, um, and notice how the animals were, were were going towards particular trees, and uh, and 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 then seeing the sap running and saying, hey, what is this? And you know it's. Uh, uh, a little bit of a, a sweet water and uh so so it started off with, with that and then you know you boil it down and make it more concentrated and uh you know and, uh that, that's kind of how uh, to my understanding of, of how, it, how it all started well and greg you, you also produced a, a wonderful documentary about this and then the whole process can you tell us a bit about your documentary yeah so um last year um around this time um the the team here at your was a we were looking at um something something different a different a different way to tell a story uh and uh so i spoke to a couple people here in the community that that do uh tap maple trees every year and and you know right from uh a, uh, a young couple who, who who tap a couple trees in their yard uh to to another guy who taps upwards of 900 trees um wow. and just said hey would you be interested in in T uh, taking part in this project and uh, we want to do you know a short 20 minute documentary about uh about maple syrup and and, and its connection to the community and they all they, everybody we, we spoke to jumped on board and uh so so we spent the next few weeks um you know going out to to people's properties and uh watching them them uh tap the trees and gather the sap and then um it was interesting because some people just have um you know uh, they're, they're collecting by bucket and others are, are uh, collecting uh using the, the large vacuum systems and uh with the tubes and everything and then bringing it down to their evaporator and uh you know and just going from there and and it was it was a really interesting process and it was a fun project well, what was the reception like for your documentary? What what did people think of it? Uh, people really, really, I think, really enjoyed it. Um, we submitted to a few film festivals, uh, and uh, we, we we got a couple of awards. Uh, so names finalists and semi finalists in a couple of them. So uh, it was it was really a fun project, and I think people really enjoyed it. Well, congratulations to you and everybody who worked on that documentary. And uh, Greg, before we let you go, I mean, our show today obviously is about spring, um, but what are, what are some of the other seasonal traditions uh, out in your neck of the woods? Um, you know, I think uh, part of it is, uh, you know, um, it, it, it just it, it, it spring is also the start of the uh, of, of a new cycle of uh, of of the year right and uh, you know here you're starting to look at uh, you know a lot of kids are starting to pick up to lacrosse and uh, and looking forward to a to a, a long summer of uh, playing playing the creators game. Well, Greg, we certainly appreciate uh, you coming on our show here and, and updating us a little bit on what happens out uh, in your in your neck of the woods, uh, as I said. So thank you so much for coming on, and uh, we really appreciate your time. Yeah, no problem at all. And to celebrate spring in Iqaluit, folks there head to the annual Tunic Time Festival. It's a chance for everyone to come out and have some fun with some traditional and not so traditional events. APTN's Steve Mangeau brings us some of the highlights from a previous festival. Starting off the last day of Tunic Time, an all-time favorite, the dog sled race. Dog runners race each other across the ice and overland to see who has the fastest team. It wasn't just dog power. There's also some serious horsepower. The uphill climb draws many competitors to see who has the fastest machine to climb Hospital Hill. Traditional skills like whipping are always fun. 
just try and hit the small wood block using a long whip. It's not as easy as it looks. There is also harpoon throwing. Even the kids had a chance to compete in the sack race. Not everyone made it. You can't have tunic time without the very popular igloo building contest, where teams cut out snow to build the perfect igloo. There was serious competition this year, with a prize for the fastest build, and one to see who can stand on their igloo. Only one came up on top. Go! Tunic time is not complete without the seal skinning competition. The competitors have to see who can skin their seal the fastest. It takes more than just a sharp knife to be fast. It takes experience. This year's winner was Ulu Swinging Pudlu Shimayuk. She finished in less than four minutes. The seals are all cut up and all the delicious meat is given out. Elders first. Some beg the ribs, while others braid the fresh intestines on the spot. No matter their age, everyone enjoyed the taste of tunic time. Well, here in Winnipeg, the Canadian Museum for Human Rights was the site of a spring equinox ceremony this week. What was unique about this one was we were allowed to film the pipe and water ceremony, which normally is not filmed. Here's some of the sights and sounds of that. It's a special type of ceremony that uh, we do at this time of the year. It's a, it's a spring equinox and uh, we want to acknowledge that because it's a new beginning. It's a, it's a new, new life ahead of us. Uh, we're hoping that uh, this new beginning, this new life brings us closer to, uh, to being uh, compassionate about each other taking care of each other and uh, looking out for each other and to have love for each other. It's a time of uh, renewal, uh, growth. Uh, it brings a lot of uh, animals out of hibernation. It brings the, a lot of uh, the winged uh, birds from the south, and uh, so it brings back a lot of a lot of life for us. And, and we acknowledge that because they play a very important part in the, in our way of life and our way of living. On us and, uh, and help us with our, with our daily living and sharing that, that kindness to one another, to be compassionate to, to, to each other. All right, that's all we have for you this afternoon on APTN In Focus. Today's episode will be available as a podcast. You can listen and subscribe on aptnnews.ca slash podcasts, or you can find us on your favorite player. And if you missed any of our past episodes and you want to catch up, you can find them and more on aptnnews.ca slash in focus. Now next week we'll be putting indigenous languages in focus. You won't want to miss that. We will be looking at all the different resources that are available, all the different apps and what people are doing to try and bring the languages back to the forefront. 
So that's what we'll, we will be doing next week on APTN In Focus. I'm Daryl Stranger. For all of us here again, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your day.